Okay, again, my name is Robert. I work for Zona Systems. Hi. This is where everybody says hi. Hi. It's the first session in the morning. Everybody's bright and bushy tailed. I love that. Okay. Postgres Linux containers in the enterprise. Yes. Okay. So here's the breakdown. Uh, I hope the microphone can pick me up because the only way to stay interesting is wander around. Okay. So we've got. In this presentation, yes, the automation, infrastructure, software, database as a service, and then the constituents of this presentation. This presentation is broken down into two sessions. What I'm going to try to do, arguably when I was creating this, I asked for a tutorial, then they gave me an hour, then they gave me back two hours, then it went down to 90 minutes, and now I'm back to this. So, what I'm going to try to do is basically get the message across, say it once as succinctly as possible, I understand that this is being recorded, so it'll go up on the YouTube channel for, for the Linux Fest. Um, in the black, automation, infrastructure, basically definitions. What we're dealing with are the four parts. Postgres, the Linux containers, ZFS, and Ansible. Um, since this is early, I can expect you guys to be reactive. Tell me, uh, just to show of hands, how many people here are familiar with the ZFS file system? Okay, how many people are here are familiar with Ansible? You don't have to work with it, just familiar, know it. Okay, oh, this is really quick. All right. All right, general definition, automation. Basically something that makes it go fast, go simply. A lot of moving parts, but it's encapsulated. Simpler instructions. Here's our definitions. Infrastructure as a service, software as a service, database as a service. The idea of simplifying things. Now once upon a time, the idea of a service was actually third party. But in companies, companies that have lots of machines or lots of virtualized machines, now they've reorganized their departments to say, okay, you are now a customer and you are now a service provider. And that's their paperwork way of saying, okay, this is how you're gonna work and this is how you're gonna stay tight. So in, a, in an environment, you're going, to prevent, you're going to present database as a server, which means you want to simplify. The ideal is have a developer, you're going to, the developer's going to brainstorm, and they're going to be able to push what they have in a pipe all the way into production. Now, to a certain degree, that does exist in some places. In other places, no. So what this session is, is we're talking about the parts. I'm talking about the parts in a generic fashion. When we go through the principles, you'll realize very quickly, even from your own experiences, that there are, there's more than one way to implement some of these things. It's just talk about it, implement it, think about the principles behind it, reinvent it. Postgres tasks, fairly traditional, straightforward if you've done uh, database uh, DBA activities. Uh, provisioning, tuning, replication, backups, failover, yes. Every environment has this in one form or another. Provisioning, at, uh, it's more, at its most primitive, we're talking about a DBA with scripts that gives the instructions, bring the servers out, get them going. Scripting, tuning, well the nice thing about tuning is if it's a consistent environment, you can template the configuration files and you have consistent do, uh, database performance. You don't have to worry about strange things. Replication, yes. In our industry, conservatively speaking, these days, the most common uh, configuration is a master standby, a primary standby configuration. You can extend it, you make it greater, but in Postgres, in the industry, right now, what I'm seeing a lot of people, they're using the two node combination. Backups. Backups, well, we've got your logical backups, PG dump. We've got our point in time recovery, log shipping. And in a sense, the, the slave or standby is a kind of backup because it's there just in case the primary doesn't serve. And we have the failover. And again, depending on the environment, a nice mature environment has all forms of backups, has all forms of replication. And you just kick it in and it goes. The issue in this case is, do you want to run it in an automated fashion, or do you want people to have the final say? And there are, there are debates. I, I see operational managers, um, or whatever they're called these days, 
they, they would like to see something automated. But the problem is, is that they also have the experience of screw-ups, of the systems not giving the correct metrics that they may not do the right thing. And if you flip the switch, well, it's not just the database. The database is easy. But the rest of the stack, DNS, name resolution, changing it all over, uh, getting the applications, uh, how, how to move, applications when they connect to the database. If you use something like Java, well, those things can be pretty aggressive. If they time out, they get upset. You have to have applications that anticipate these conditions. Some applications I've seen, they will sit quietly when the connection is stalled for whatever reasons. Maybe it's blockage, maybe the connection pooler has said, okay, cease communications for a minute. That's great. It gives us, modularizes the environment. But there are other situations where the clients, they use object relational mappers and they're quick, they're nasty. People are interested in creating their solution but they don't touch the settings, which means those default settings are extremely aggressive. And they get upset if you do failovers, which upsets the customer. Okay, Linux containers, little definition. Now, the module, as I said, we broke it down. Postgres, Linux containers, EFS. I don't wanna to talk too much about Linux containers at this juncture, at this exact point. I'm gonna pick it up in a few minutes down the road. Uh, there's a lot to say, a lot to know about this. I am going to start a flame war when I talk about this. Um, a Linux container is also known as an OS container, or in Google parlance, a machine container. If we talk about containers, um, I don't have the graphics, I don't have the picture, so I want you to imagine this. Imagine a dinosaur, an elephant, a horse, a dog, okay? Dinosaur is an old-fashioned hardware machine, huge and monstrous. It is extremely powerful. Now, dinosaurs died off not because of their own doom, but because of something outside their environment. Ha very powerful, very useful, but a lot of work to manage it because the resources are so tremendous. Well, to deal with the resources and to deal with the recognition that we had different needs, needs that are actually unrelated to each other, we broke it down. The first generation was virtual machines. <coughs> the virtual machines assigned CPUs, assigned RAM, assigned disk space, and you had a little machine inside this bigger machine. It could still do everything and you could still control it. So we started with our dinosaur, we moved into our elephant. Well, at some point, as does the industry, we started specializing, specializing activities. So we have this horse and dog routine. Now, let me skip over to the dog before I get to the horse. The dog is extremely, extremely flexible, extremely specialized. It can be used to carry things, yes. It can be used for search and rescue, it can be used as guard, it's specialized. Very, very lightweight. You give it a task, you train it for that particular task. Can you train it for other things? Yes, but it takes work. That's a docker. That's an application container. Now let's go to the horse. The horse is a Linux container, an operating system container. It's bigger. It can carry more resources. Now, the difference with the containers is that they sit on an OS, the overriding environment, that big dinosaur or that elephant, depending how you design your architecture. So it's gonna get the CPUs, it's gonna get the kernel, it's gonna get the memory, and all it is is just Isolation. So it's very, very quick, very lightweight. The horse is an isolation of an operating system. And here's the difference. Postgres is a living, breathing process. It changes with time, time of day, time of day, uh, week, time of month. It's a dynamic process. Things happen. Applications don't. You architect it correctly, it's either gonna do the job or it's not. If it's not and it's still working correctly, you just add more processes. You can't have that kind of specialization in a database environment because you can't take into account rsync, OpenSSH. You can't take into account log shipping, 
playing with the system dynamically. Docker, you have to plan this all ahead. And there's a lot of people, a lot of teams, a lot of companies that are out doing that. But I'm suggesting right now, they're going to have problems when it deals with something like a database system. There is too much variance. Sure it can be done, and sure it is being done. But I, st I stay away from that. I don't, I, I'm saying right now for the record, Docker and Postgres do not work together. If you see the environment, you make a little cross, you step away, you take some holy water, sprinkle it on you, and you run. Yes? Is that because uh, Docker only has adding 10 layers in 12 days? Or Docker <coughs> has its own work. Docker was designed for application developers. That means the mindset to develop a, a database system is in the mindset of a developer. They are going to spend half their work administrating the database and half their work developing the environment for the database. If something breaks, well, they're going to work with what they know. That means the environment. They'll work on fixing the environment. An operating system container is a traditional environment. It's somebody who works in that environment, whether it's, it's, it's the rough big machine or whether it's a VM, it's all familiar. All the protocols, all the processes, they're the same. If there's a problem, you work with the problem. In Docker, you need to frame the environment before you can work on the, on, on the problem. The problem isn't that you can't solve it. The problem is resources. How much time do you work on the environment? How much time do you work on the database? And that's specialization. And you're talking about mind share. You're talking about the knowledge of a person. And if it's one thing I've learned in my career as a Postgres DBA, really playing with the, D with the database that's specialized knowledge. To really get good with Postgres, you play with it. You enjoy doing it. Developers who cut their teeth and are damn good developers, they have enough to make the system work. They have enough to scale the system to a point. They don't have the time to go into the innards and guts of a database system. There's going to be problems. Your dinosaur, your elephant, your horse, your dog. They're all different. They can all, to a certain degree, be used to do the same thing. But the smaller the resources, the more activity and more design time you need to do the one thing. Docker is a great solution in an application context, not in a database service context. I, I disagree with other people who are, who are of the opinion contrary. I don't agree with it and time will bear me out. Okay, that's my flame war. All right, ZFS. ZFS made its name over the years on Solaris, on the BSD. And of all the kinds of conferences that you can go to, open source, Linux Fest, this is where you're gonna most likely run into people who actually know free BSD. ZFS is really, really good. Just tell Netflix. And Netflix will say, yeah, because that's how they run their system. All right, let's have a uh, reiteration. A file system designed for super large storage. It's not a network storage. It's a single device storage. It has ability against data corruption, automatic repair, which means it's got the switches, the funny little features inside that can check some blocks of data to make sure that it doesn't uh, doesn't change over time. And if anything needs to be checked, it's a database and with consistency. Support for high storage capacity, efficient data compression. ZFS, properly tuned, you actually get higher performance because your re the I.O. is less when the database reads from the file. This is a real interesting capability. Imagine an environment. You have a system, two terabytes, it's a development machine. Well, you can create your development machine. You can spend all this time, but you're going to have developers come in and break things. That's what a development machine is all about. But you want to give them the time of creating a good quality data set. On a ZFS system, you create a snapshot. It freezes it. That's the change. That's the system. It only takes a second. Two terabytes, a second. 20 terabytes, if that existed, a second. 
It's the nature of the file system because what it records is not the copy of the data. It records from the time of creation the changes on the original copy on the master. That's all it does. It just records it. So if you've got a huge data rep uh, repository, that's great because that's the only file, that's the only consumption of the file system. So it, 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 it has so much potential, so much potential. And we'll go into the system, we'll rehash it. Again, it, what's nice about this group is because of your ZFS familiarization, it helps just to get things jogging. There are things that are probably you've done that I haven't done with this. Native NFS, that's kind of cool. Access control limits, again, very cool, very nice. The creation of the file systems, once you have the pool defined, it's very, very versatile. And it's what I like, it's self-documenting. You write the commands and you'll see what's going on. Again, all these modules, all these ideas in the presentation that I have in mind, it's, we're going to break it down, we're going to review it again. All right, so this environment, this presentation, this is my workstation. I used a, an old 14.04 Ubuntu version, or actually I used Kubuntu on my workstation. And my workstation is a machine that I constructed in 2009. And every so often I swap out parts, change the hard drive, jump up the RAM, switch the keyboard. Technology is nice because the OS advances and it still works. So, in a summary, we're talking about replicating the environment that we're talking about, these materials in automation, on this environment that I'm presenting for you. The first step was to create the containers. The second, install the ZFS, create the, uh, the ZFS pool. And the pool is the defining of the system, of devices. ZFS is capable of creating raids. It's capable of mirroring. It's capable of striping. Not the Linux version, but the FreeBSD version, the Solaris versions, or the generations after Solaris. Encryption is capable as well. Once you've mounted it for the container environment, the next thing is you create your uh, container templates. And in this example, there's only two. One is the OS template. The other one is a Postgres template, which is adding things onto it, adding the features. These templates are what I'm going to use to create my containers. And the nice thing again is, because it's OS, I don't have to worry too much about configuration. Yes? Could I translate the template to be for feature scaling? Basically what it is, it's, it's, it's an operating system container. I put in the packages. I'm satisfied with what I want in it. And then when I want to create new containers, I give the command, copy this to that. It's there. Now the Linux container, uh, the LXC, Auto Workstation has automatic name resolution. So you give it a name and you're in the environment, you just ping the name that you give. There, you don't have to worry about IP addresses. Again, it's a nice convenience. LXC also has the ability that if you reach a certain point, you can twiddle the configurations and suddenly it's exposed out into the real network. So at its simplest implementation, you put this on a super big machine and you reconfigure so that it, uh, it gets uh, it, its IP resolution from uh, a proper network, and this thing's now accessible. You've got a working, um, a working container environment, a, a working environment for automation. Again, at this point, we're just talking about principles because the cloud already does this. They have their own secret sauce. They have their own way of doing things, but it's along the line. Okay, the last container is Ansible. Now, I've got another session tomorrow in the afternoon that's going to go into detail from A to Z on Ansible. Depending on how well I talk this morning, I may or may not do the same coverage. I'm certainly going to do the overview on, on the Ansible. Now the Ansible, just to, to rehash, it's the ability to push instructions out. It's a simple way of pushing the same instructions to different containers. It's even got a little programming language where you can decide depending on the variables that it gets fed. And it does it over SSH, which is really, really nice because SSH is the most common uh, medium that we use to log into our machines. This is a cheat. I hate typing passwords. So 
I just go into my environment, I went to VI sudo, and I just said, okay, grant permissions, no password. Again, it's, it's a cheat, and it's for convenience, it's for development purposes. Um, just to give you a context about the reality of developing in a very small environment, back in 2009, I prototyped a two data center, six node system that was implemented eventually between Seattle and Atlanta. It ran the back end of T-Mobile. I ran it and I developed this on a $1,500 laptop. The code essentially was created and tested and then I just pushed it up. So don't underestimate what you can do on these machines. All right, that's the end of my first of four modules, my automation. Questions at this point? Yes? So do you think that's why Docker introduced the NIST kit at the Docker Tom, so that you can create the lean operating systems when you're using Docker? Do you know the history how, uh, how Docker came out, how it first started? Uh, no. They used the library. Docker was built on Linux containers. Then when they saw the success, part of their business plan was to continue. They, they continued streamlining the container, the, the, the technology, and they wrote their own main library. Instead of using the, the LXC, the Linux container libraries, they forked it. They created their own implementation. The biggest difference the, in one phrase, the biggest difference between Docker and Linux containers is there's no network stack. A network stack does not exist in Docker. Any other questions? Okay, so let's see how we're doing here. Half an hour. Okay. As you can tell, I've got lots of coffee in my blood right now. Okay, next part. Now, in this presentation, you saw the steps, and it was swinging back and forth between Linux containers, EFS, then finally to Ansible. For the purposes of just talking about the technology, I'm just trying to stick to one at a time. So for now, it's just Linux containers. If something's done in another context, we just sort of slide over it. Linux containers versus LXD versus Docker. Uh, a lot of the initial issues uh, that, that, that are presented have been done. Does anybody here, give me a show of hands. LXD, who has heard of it? LXD. Okay, who has ever heard of the word serendipity? <laughs> Raise your hand. Okay, here's what happened. Once upon a time, Ubuntu, canonical, created LXC, Linux containers. And Docker saw it and said, ooh, this is cool. And they took off. It got so successful. And Linux containers continued with evolution. People started coming back to Canonical and saying, hey, how come you don't have an orchestration mechanism just for the Linux container? And they went, duh, hadn't thought of it. LXD is an orchestration environment. It came up after LXC had been created, after Docker took LXC and went with it and took it to where it's going right now. So it is a parallel environment, except it deals specifically with containers. Um, Kubernetes is a very, very dominating culture right now um, with orchestration, controlling, manipulating containers. But it specializes with the Docker implementation. They don't have Linux containers, unless you wander over to Canonical's website, and then they talk about their implementation of Kubernetes, which does deal with Linux containers. So choosing one or the other is going to be depending on where you sit. If it's a question of money and not willing to pay, you may want to go with Kubernetes with Docker. It's a great choice for application development. But once you start looking at the back end, or in, 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 the, in the context of a house, if the house is an IT stack, the database system is the basement, the foundation. It is unsexy, it is plain. 
It's the last thing people need, but it's the first thing they have to have. If you're going to do automation, if you're going to do containers, you have to take that into consideration because the team isn't going to be the same. It's not going to be the same people as opposed to those who are developing the solution. Now, OS machines versus application containers. OS machines, it's, that's sort of Google terminology. They like calling things by, uh, by calling them uh, um, machine containers. And it's basically a, an operating system container. And it has to do with business -y. Um, the largest implementation is actually through Linux containers, Ubuntu canonical stuff on the internet. Google uses it, but it doesn't say canonical, it doesn't say Ubuntu, it just says machine containers, which is fair. We don't care. We have a problem. It has a means of solving the problem. We don't care how they do it. Right now, I'm talking from the point of view if you're creating something from the ground up or if you're trying to understand what's going on out there. This is the easiest way to install Linux containers on Ubuntu. Now, Linux containers exist on CentOS. They exist on CentOS 6, CentOS 7, on Red Hat. However, the best implementation with the best OS configurations, options, availability, distributions, is the Ubuntu system, and partly because it's the most mature. But you can literally install Linux containers on any of the major OS right now. This demonstration is working with the Ubuntu implementation. So in this case, it's just install LXC. That's it. Everything else will get installed. Um, on the bottom, security, a root versus unprivileged user. The orchestration mechanisms, they put it on an unsecure, on an ordinary user account control. The reason is that they don't want the thing to lose control. You don't want to give it root capability. For our development purposes, again, just pseudo, do your thing as root. However, LXD, and again, Docker, they all go into this effort about controlling. Now, right now, the industry says security is not that hot with uh, containers. And that, that goes across Linux containers, it goes across Docker. The biggest thing is they just don't know. They don't know what it means. All they know is there is potential. There are a lot of knobs and a lot of switches in the Linux container, in LXC, to control security, to control privileges, to control um, all sorts of things. It's a start, yeah. We're just scratching the surface. I just want, you to, I just want to say it, it's there. It's implemented in configuration files. It's there. Once you install LXC, this is an echo code. In the red, these are the actual commands that were used in making up this presentation. Not then, you don't really need that much. Um, let's put it this way. First, you're going to create your container. You might want to optionally copy it after you've updated it. But to update it, you need to start it, which is on the next page. And then after that, you attach to it. Once it's attached, you're in there as root. Then you can do everything you want. This little command is basically a list of all the containers that are there. Now, what I've just done is a very, very quick, fast summary. I hope you'll take the time after this to download the slides, and you have a look, and then you just play with the commands yourself, figure it out. Everything else, they're all important. They're all useful commands. But in the context of this presentation, I just want to cut it simple. Straight to the point. These are the other two commands, the start and the stops. Lots and lots to choose, lots to, to think about, but you don't need many commands just to get going. So this is a partial snippet. The Ubuntu implementation starts with Alpine, and look at the architecture, AMD, ARM, SHS, Internet, um, Intel 386, it goes on and on. There, are, I think there's about 90 distributions available on this particular implementation, on the canonical implementation of Linux containers. If you were developing on CentOS, there's no problem because CentOS is in there. CentOS 6, CentOS 7, they're both there. 
if you wanted to go with Ubuntu. You can see even the most ver recent versions of, of Ubuntu are in there. Normally when you install the, the package, everything is already up to date. It's, uh, you'll see a timestamp when they were created. Their farm generates it and updates the libraries automatically. There's even an implementation of Oracle. The Oracle OS is in here too. So it, there's a lot, of, a lot of choices. So we're in our Linux container. We decide, okay, let's create. So what do we do? This is actually one line. You see the backslash at the end of the line, which could be <laughs> here. Now there's the first, the previous slide. Let me go back to that for a second. Look at the top. See where it says, let's create, t download, and I just call it end my container. It's a wizard. It's a console-based wizard. It's going to generate the huge list, and then at the bottom, it's going to start asking you questions. It's going to start with distribution, then go to release, then go to architecture, and then it's going to say variants. Or not variants, but um, just these three questions. Once those are three, then it'll download the copy, and you're, and you're good to go. This slide is just, you already know the answers ahead of time. I want an Ubuntu version, I want the Xenial version, I want AMD64 version. It's going to be created. I'm going to name it as a template Ubuntu. You can see here from the switch. So I start it, and then I attach. LXC attach. So now I've got in the terminal, right now, root. No security, no password, nothing. Just log in. It's got internet capabilities. It's the machine that it's sitting on the container, the host has internet, this thing has got internet. It does the name resolution automatically. So I'm going to update my packages. And in this case, update up this uh, disk upgrade, yes. If you downloaded and then you did an upgrade, you'd find nothing would be installed. It's up to date. The next line are the packages that you want installed. So in this case, open SSH. This is a little console, uh, console. MC stands for Midnight Commander. Anybody here not heard of that? Okay. Let me show you what it is. Let me go back just for a second. Oops. There we go. That's MC. It is a command line console with panels. Back in 96, I used this to learn Linux because it had menus, and it said, ooh, what's a symlink? Ooh, what's ownership? All the menus were in there. Two panels, left side and right side. It's a great, simple way to see what's going on. So I installed Midnight Commander on my server default, because then I could just navigate and shift things over. Other packages, screen extremely useful, extremely, it's the lazy man's, uh, lazy administrator's way of doing things. Why set up a no-op? Why set up a cron job? Just open up screen, start the silly thing, detach the process, go home, reattach it to your machine, look out and says, oh, it's still going, time for pizza. Very useful. This, for me, is useful, incredibly useful. Man pages. Uh, Debian derivatives, mlocate, is a, is a suite of utilities that allows you to track and collate and collect and list every file on your operating system. I find that really useful when I don't know what I'm doing. I use the command locate, give the name of the file or a portion of the file, then I page it, and then I just look for the phrase that, oh, it's there. Python, this is for Postgres. This is the wrapper necessary for Ansible to connect to Postgres servers. Now, I put it in my template OS. I didn't want to take any chances, so I just put it in there. And of course, Vim. Believe it or not, Vim is not on by, the, by default. And on the other hand, they don't install by default Emacs either, so I guess we're safe. Um, once it's all installed, man DB, update DB, 
These are the commands to look, update the man pages. Again, you want to know what's going on. The man pages are wonderful. A little common sense on updating the passwords. All Ubuntu implementations, they create an account called Ubuntu, and I just make sure that, okay, let's make sure the password is simple, very simple. No, don't type in Ubuntu, you know, type something actually intelligent, but for demonstration purposes, this solves the point. Uh, I'm done. I exit, control D, or type exit, whatever. I'm back now in the host control. Now I stop it. Galaxy yeah, stop, template Ubuntu, now I'm going to copy it, which is a simple copy. LXE dash copy, little n template Ubuntu, big n Ansible, and I also create my template for Postgres. I created them separately because of division of packages. I just don't like the idea of putting too much of the same packages on systems. That's how systems get hacked. That's how you lose control, by being too generic. Okay, so what am I going to put in, in my template? For Postgres, I'm going to use 9.6. Has anybody ever tried to administrate Postgres using CentOS? Just raise your hand, I want to know. Okay, all right, for everybody else, it's miserable. Okay, it's miserable. CentOS 6 is an incredibly stable operating system. It's being supplanted by version 7, yes but it's still useful, it's still incredibly, incredibly important. However, the default repository has a version of Postgres that hasn't been used in four years. It drives me nuts. It, it, it's the stability conundrum. You want a stable environment, you don't change things. So you have to add packages. Now, the Fedora packaging system, they do have versions of Postgres a little more up to date, and you, you can add the repository. In this case, we're ignoring all of that. All Linux distributions are all configured and prepared on the Postgres website. Every package path, every package implementation is already there. All you need to know is just how to navigate through the pages. In this case, we're going to install 9.6 and we're going to use the Debian implementation. These lines here, after the prep work for data cluster, these are the instructions to get 9.6 installed. So basically, as per the web page in Postgres, and you go there by hitting the download and you'll navigate. I'm not showing you now, but right here, echo dev http, this is a copy paste. I just paste, copy paste straight from their web page, put it in my console, and what it's going to do is it's going to add a new package, the Postgres package. Then I'm going to use wget, and that's the certificate key. That makes certain that at least I'm not going to have any problems getting a new version. Now here's a thing that I want you to keep in mind. I do this for real. I am really lucky. I am the dungeon master of my environment. I answer to nobody. But in your environment, you may have a policy of only having a repository that you are allowed to get your stuff. You have sysadmins that go in, they collect their packages, they put it in one repository, and that's where you're going to get your packages. This is something you have to show them. This is something you have to have a conversation. Because if you're going to have up-to-date stuff, they're going to have to pull it, and you're going to have to show them how to do it. Once it's done, update, update. Update the repository. Now I've got my 9.6. And if you've ever gone to the Postgres website, it's not just Postgres. There's like 20 or 30 different packages there available. Everything from PG Bouncer, the connection pooling, to Barmet, which is a utility used for um, uh, enterprise level capabilities of getting point in time replication and restoration across servers. This presentation is automation. Automation is about lots and lots of containers. Take advantage of those things. Look at the stuff. There's ways of reading the package information. All sorts of cool things. Okay, so after that we install. In here I've installed what I need for uh, Postgres. The install Postgres 9.6, Postgres repack, PG Bouncer, rsync. Okay, 
little talk. Raise your hands again. Who does not know what a repack is? Does not know. Okay. Repack is a utility that came out a few years back. There is a problem with Postgres. Multi-version concurrency control is the ability to see snapshots while the records are being updated, inserted, deleted, without conflicting with other sessions. However, that means the database system is going to mark tuples as dead. We have something called auto vacuum that goes in and cleans it up. There are edge cases, however. That auto vacuum is not perfect. There are going to be spaces in the files that are archived, that become what are our tables, our indexes, that cannot be reclaimed, can't be reformatted. There are various reasons for different conditions. Older versions of Postgres are worse than the newer versions for different reasons. PG Repack is the response to this. It is a utility that allows you to rebuild the tables and the indexes in the background while the system is under load. I have seen recoveries of 300 gigs of databases using PG Repack because nobody knew that this kind of thing existed. Repack is good also because it allows you to move things. I've got a server. It's almost at the limit of its hard drive. Right now, we've got a mixed environment, partially VM, partly real machine. I've told the sysadmin, hey, you start running out of space, we're going to move some of these tables over into another partition that you're going to add onto the environment. They don't like that. It scares them because of, it's inconsistent with the rest of the network. But with PG Repack, at least I can move it in the background, no downtime. Very, very cool. Very simple. PG Bouncer, a connection cooler. Another question, how many people have worked with Java? Raise your hand. Okay, any broken fingers there? <laughs> Bad experiences? Java has uh, its default suite, its default capabilities, has an extremely aggressive connection pool. If you have an application, and if the developers have not changed the default values, if the connection pool decides on its own that, hey, you're not responding fast enough, hey, I'm not getting what I want, it's going to spawn a new connection. I have seen connections go from 90 to 900 in 10 seconds. A connection store. PG Bouncer is Postgres native. It's a firewall. It will block this kind of nonsense. Also, the traditional reason why you have a connection tool is because Postgres is a forked process. That's overhead in, in creating a connection. It takes a little more time than something that MySQL does. If you have a connection pooler, it already has the repository, the collection of connections already going into Postgres. So something goes in, snap, it goes fast. Very, very good, very high responsive. It has other capabilities too. Do you want security? I can alias the user account and the database. Application will use a certain name, a certain uh, database, even a certain password. We can translate it right in that configuration file, and it'll go somewhere else. Now, apart from security, that's really good for load balancing. There was this one case where we had 90% reads on an environment and 10% writes. I set up a three system node. I said, okay, two of the three are going to be read only. So I said, okay, let's adjust your user account, uh, your database. Database read write, database read only. Automatically hit the connection folder, no change in source code, it's just a configuration file, and bang, it went. It went to the correct place. Your own little poor man's ba uh, load balancer. It is a connection pooler in its own right, but it has additional advantages. The essence of connection pooling is to make connecting faster, to make it more reliable, to manage resources. You can, with a proper connection pool, if you have OLTP connections, for example, instead of having a thousand connections configured for your Postgres, you can make do with 50. Why? Because these connection sessions open up and they close really fast. That kind of decision making, though, is up to you because you're going to have to watch. You're going to have to actually learn on your own. Okay, is there any case where these connections are going to last and they're going to pile up? Do I need more connections? Because uh, PG Bounce, for example, it'll politely refuse new connectors. It has all sorts of options. For example, it has the ability to have a reserve pool. 
And that reserve pool, you can have it configured to say, just hold on the connections, don't do anything. So new connections come in, connections go in. If your application is polite, it'll sit there. It'll wait until the connection cooler says, okay, now we can use you, now we can access the database. Lots of opportunity, lots of opportunity. It's, it's more than just a connection cooler. It's a gatekeeper. That's why I use this, that's why I use Repack. R-Sync, R-Sync is a cover thy ass <laughs> approach, okay? Postgres has stream replication. Technically, it can stream the data over to a target server for slave. Well, you know what? Shit happens. Firewalls change. Servers go to another direction. R-Sync is my, back, my backstop. It's a just in case. I need to copy some files dynamically, automatically. I'll use that mechanism. Now, I've seen some environments that use SCP because they're very secure. Well, SCP has an interesting property. 16 megabytes, you know how many writes it takes? 1,000. 1,000 individual writes to load up a 16 megabyte. That's, that's the protocol. It's not meant to be high performance. It's meant to be secure. It's meant to be stable. Oh dear. Okay, so let me get back here, my password. I gotta use simpler passwords. There we go. Okay. <coughs> All right. So what I've done so far is I've just described to you the justification of arguments for installing packages. It's nice to talk about these things. These, if I wanted to do this properly under the context that I want to, all the materials, we're talking about a week. Just a week of going through this. It is really cool. Some of the things I can read. Actually, that's how come I get hired. I get hired because I'm so excited. All right, so we've come with this, we've done our installation. Um, I'm gonna load up this Postgres. The reason why I use the Postgres packages is because they have decided ahead of time where things are gonna go. And the, where it goes is always consistent no matter what version or distribution of Linux. That's really good for me because it allows me to plan out because I don't know what version of, 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 or of, of Linux I'm using or distribution until I, I drop in there. The community has directories called data, directories called backups, and they're in the home directory, which is typically var, live, pgsql, and then they break it down to the version. CentOS has a problem. When it brings down Postgres, it brings down Postgres. It doesn't say Postgres version dot dot, which makes it problematic if you're doing upgrades. That means you've got to do the work ahead of time. You've got to figure out and plan ahead of time. Using the community version, everything's already in play. Okay, now from here, um, now, unfortunately, on Debian distributions, the server, once the package gets installed, it gets boot, it creates a data cluster and boots it up. CentOS is polite. It'll just install and that's it. No data cluster is created. I have to take this into account because I don't want this cluster to run. I don't even want it to exist. So in this case, I just shut it down, leave it alone. So I created a directory. That's not where this cluster is. It's located somewhere else. But this is going to be my real directory. And this is going to be pointed out to a mount point on ZFS on my host machine. So I go in into the current machine that's been booted up. And I'm going to use an alter system command. Alter system came out, I think, in 9.4, 9.5. And what it does is actually writes a separate PostgreSQL.configuration file called PostgreSQL.auto.conf, I think. This is the information that I want to keep. Now this, the reason why I use that and I don't edit the Postgres file is because it's easier to understand. I want consistency across the environment. So if I make a change to the environment, I want to be able to know where it is. I don't want to read special comments. You want misery? You look at the configuration file in Puppet. That is hell, especially when somebody else creates it. So in this case, I said, OK, set the server to port 10,096. That means when the system restarts, it's going to come up. The Debian implementation, the Ubuntu implementation, if it sees 
a data cluster existing and it's creating a new one, and it sees that it's port 5432, it'll come up with another number. It'll increment 5433, which is what I don't want. That's why I'm changing the number. On CentOS, you don't have to worry about it. That's not problematic. But on Debian, yes it is, because it actually search and hunts it out. Makes things simple for you to deal with. Okay, so I was pseudo as root. Now I'm going to get, I'm going to change my that. asshole. Uh, here, change to the configuration file. In the Debian, the Debian implementation has actually a, an add-on. This is one of the things that drive me crazy about Debian. They have, it, it's like a cook. They add ingredients to the recipe. You want to upset a French cook, add sugar or salt. That'll just drive them nuts. Debian does their own thing. They add a little extra command, a configuration file that controls and manipulates the system. So I gotta go in and I gotta go into this configuration file called start.com. It's located in Etsy. And I gotta say manual. That'll prevent the system from coming up again. Because I'm gonna shut down the server when I turn off the, the container. I get out, return to the host, Linux stop. Now the cluster is off. Now, I've got a couple more slides for this, and then we'll take a break. So, this is a bash script for you in sequence four. I am being so lazy. I'm creating four instances of containers. That's it. I'm copying it out, and I'm going to, this is the interesting part. Now I'm going to edit the configuration file for the Linux containers. Linux containers are all located in a certain directory. They have certain configuration files, lots and lots of options. All I'm going to do is go to one file, go to the bottom of that file, and I'm going to add an instruction. And I'm going to say LXC mount entry, and then I give off a path. This path will exist in the Linux container. I mount on my host, my ZFS file systems. I'm going to have a collection of walls, of data clusters, on this common storage system. Now, in our development environment, this is a laptop with one file system. But in the real world, we're talking about a NAS or a SAN. We're talking about a centralized storage system. And this is not, if not what you're going to do, it will be what you're going to do. This is the way industry is going. Performance is such on a network, so fast, that now we have data clusters that are disengaged. They are no longer part of the machine or the container that contains the process. That's the way it is, folks. That's the new reality. This is the configuration file that's going to mount it on my system so that when I turn on those Postgres instances, they're going to see the mount point. When those servers turn on in those containers, they're going to save them to there. It's already all set. It's all configured. It's all done. All I have to do is just turn it off. This is about Ansible. Up till now, all I've done is set the environment. But Postgres is a dynamic environment. It's a creature. It's a dragon. It lays eggs. It eats gold. It flies. It gobbles up people. Ansible will take care of the configuration after it's up and running. You're going to have environments that are going to be different. You lose your consistency. Why? Because that's the way it is. Machines act different. So you need to have something to deal with. It. Ansible will do that. We create our, our container, we add our packages. In this case, Debian, I needed not only Ansible, but I also needed something for SSH pass. It needs that consistency. It needs that little extra mechanism because Ansible can take your password and automatically propagate your activities right against it, which is kind of sweet. But it asks for SSH pass to do that. I go into Ubuntu, I'm going to sudo. I'm going to generate my keys. Now, when I do the Ansible presentation part, I've actually got an Ansible script that generates its keys on its own. This is a cover thy ass approach. There are two ways to enter a container. One is by password, one is by key. I use the public key because you know what? When I go on vacation and I come back, sometimes the silly password's changed. At least I have a guarantee of logging into the system and fixing the machine. So I use the utility here, in this case, SSH copy ID, which is a standard open SSH uh, utility. 
for copying a public key. Questions? Okay. Take a break. I've been running a mile a minute here. It is now uh, 9, 10, 35 or whatever. Say what? Uh, 10 minutes? 15 minutes? Come back, uh, come back to quarter two. Avoids the auto curation, so, which in turn avoids auto start, obviously. There's more than one when it's going to go. Yeah. But that, uh, that avoids having it start up, which can be, and then shutting it down, which can be problematic. Yeah. You know, when I was creating this, I was trying to figure out okay, there's so many ways to say this. What, what's going to be my guiding principle on making a decision? And part of it is, the fewest steps as possible. Yeah. Part of it. And sometimes uh, I miss something, which is really common. Yeah. I, 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 I've done it that way, way too. Uh, the, what, the shutdown way. It's, yeah. um, I, my, do, my development machine at home uses CFS. Uh, yeah, but post, I don't have Postgres containerized. So, yeah. It does mean that um, to install it to the right place, I had to do a shutdown, move, move, uh, move the files, start up sequence, and I'm not, I'm not sure it's any uh, simpler doing that, having done both that way a few times. I'm not sure it's any more complicated either. It's there's more than one way to yeah. skin a cat. I actually have some interesting results on ZFS compression um, uh, and uh, record size on my books. ZFS is almost what Postgres was like a few years earlier. Um, it's possible. Yes. What time are you starting up again? They want to know when they want to start recording. I would say at about a quarter to two. I've asked everybody to come back by then. Okay, okay. The. Uh, what were we talking about? Yeah, I, I've, I have some results yes. about ZFS on my system. ZFS is like what Postgres was in two years. More of a black box, not because it couldn't do the job, but because knowing what to do to make it really good wasn't its own. ZFS, he is mature. Certainly on the VSD contract, it's mature. Yeah. There are ways, I've got a friend of mine, he's a contractor, and he's got a 10 terabyte system, his own setup that he deals with for, for analytics. And because of the size of RAM, he has found that if he limits the shared buffer to one gig for Postgres and throws all the resources for RAM to DFS, he gets faster performance. So he, uh, he, he, he minimizes the tuning on Postgres. Well, the general advice has been to limit Postgres shared buffers to not more than a certain size. Under traditional conditions, we've looked at between four and eight gigs. Um, because of oh, only on recent versions, it used to be uh, on say <coughs> nine three. Or, I think it, I can't. It used to be generally don't go over a, a gig or two. Uh, I mean, no. It's a, yeah, it's right. the shared buffer. It's about sharing. It's about so Linux copies the memory. It's it, it's redundancy. It's double redundancies. Yeah. There's inefficiencies there. Yes, and that is one, actually one of the big problems with. Um, I, I've run Z, ZFS on FreeBSD and ZFS on Linux, and one of the big problems I find with ZFS on li Linux is actually around the memory stuff that it doesn't work as transparently as the buffer cache does for setting involving ext4 or as it does on um, you know, on BSD and if you're running stuff it's easy it's easier to put your system out of memory um, if you have something that suddenly grabs a lot of RAM, yeah. particularly <laughs> if you're using overcommit as well, and ZFS is atrocious also when it runs out of RAM, so. 
Hello. Like we can use my turn here at Twitter. One more instance. Right. My turn here Twitter. Oh, I don't have a Twitter. She has a Twitter. She said you were past the How do you have a Twitter? Oh, I have the old Twitter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had a Twitter for Caltrain schedule. Right. So, that's okay. I was just going to post like the picture. For instance, right now. That's your account. Can you use it? Yeah, yeah, no, no. I do have a Twitter account. I told you he's just tweeting There's government. Yeah. Some people don't like the amount of it on the way you refer to it. No, well, it's the, not really it's about that. It's just that I don't do it as much as they do low because of the entire It's a bad way to get in touch with you, basically. And there's settings that we that when it whirls. So that I've got one. Yeah, 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 it's, it's a nice, stable way. I find, find the Internet Commander really useful because it helps conceptualize things in your head. Really? You never know. use it, but it's like, um, not part of our configuration. Oh, yeah, it's, okay, it, it's, useful. it's useful. Oh, I, don't use it, I don't use it as much, but sometimes when I'm switching back and forth between... I'm trying to forget the bridge instances, like when you tag multiple files, it's kind of... Yeah, I, yeah it's, it's really good. I don't like the application for Yeah, I, when I was looking at it, I found very little on uh, tuning so ZFS and tuning Postgres uh, for, for that application, for Postgres on ZFS. So there's not, there wasn't much information. I think the problem is more no. traditional uh, than so anything else. The okay, people that so know, it's too damn busy. That's in front of two ECTs. Yeah, um, so each of I agree with that. Is running and I wrote uh, up. Still one of the blog posts I actually use for myself. And then we're using the Apache mod SVGI server to run the Rails application, right? Um, each each configuration. So like the configuration I have for Dyer. Yeah, I looked at LZ4 uh, and um, AK versus one. 28k records for both um, for both data and for xlog um, which is a combination of a, of a number of settings which LZ4 um, and the workload was OSM to future SQL which does a lot of copy and then Right, and so, um, so copying, inserting, and some you know, simple patching, the and then a to giant to 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 those different ones. But they can, yeah, they can. <laughs> now they cool. it, it takes so 20 hours to build index. It's okay. a 200 gig index. Uh, how big is your database? Or that? Well, if it's an index, then you're terrible. Then you're. Each, it's not a functional batch. index, right? No, it's not a functional which index. Is, That's just a. Uh, and your table is in the terabytes. No, it's a G So the table oh. schema is. Uh, yeah. What is it? It's it's uh, big int uh, text array and then big int array. We have some control. And the index is and the index is it's a gin index on the big, big int array. We might say so that you can find more rows more that have a particular we element. Also we also have control. The, the table is about more 100 gigs. Uh, the index is about 200 gigs. Uh, yeah, that sounds like you've got a puzzle on your hands. Um, and as that is, as that is a, that's the most basic way to do it. I've um, never yeah. heard of, of, of the index being bigger than yes. the table. Coming yeah. close to the size yeah. of the table, yes. I, I, but have you used genetic indexes? Is the question. Not, not as much. Here. Not as much. You're, you're talking about GIS. You're talking about three space four. You're talking about a different way of indexing. I mean, so in rough numbers, there are 300 million rows. And the total, the total, the total number yeah, of like both array entries and distinct array entries is three billion. So it has to index as three billion. Well, if the performance is good, you can't have success. The performance is 
adequate. It got it's held for cash contention uh, for obvious reasons. Then it sounds like what you're going to have to do is break it up, partition it, so you can run multiple queries at the same parallel logic queries. It's still going to be held for cash contention, though. Because, uh, because you got a puzzle. You got a puzzle. Oh, no, but we have works. Yeah, so, I mean, it is generally the best approach. Which, it doesn't mean it's a good approach, but. Is, the envi is it stable, or are you always changing right now? Um, there is always change on it, but, it's not, but the change is a small percentage of the total table size. So it's not to say you need to re-index frequently. Um, Gene indexes do, t however, tend to bloat up pretty badly. Uh, I mean, if you, there's also a, a primary key on it, which is just a, on the table, which is just a big tree. If you measure the bloat as current size versus size, if you were to re-index, gin indexes bloat faster than gist uh, or v-tree indexes. Um, and a 15 hour or 20 hour rebuild is a disincentive to um, re indexing. Yeah. Uh, now, to be fair, on the, that's on a hard drive, that's on my home machine. On, on the machine, I've been doing testing, which, which is a terabyte of NVMe, it is closer to a two hour index rebuild. On what is the fastest. Or what was two years ago the fastest machine possible for the task that you could buy with any amount of money? Okay, so I'm going to start in about one minute. Is there anybody else that you know of that's still out there doing breaking and back in? No, I, 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 when I started preparing this presentation, I started out with the Ubuntu set of six, set of seven, and then I said to myself, I'm making a lot of effort myself. And then that one can have the static connection. So if I use that, I use CentOS Office, so we can have a really challenge. I grab a pack, Postgres pack is from Postgres. Yeah. They still use the directories? It's so the same thing. Version right. the, 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 now, the, we the have procedure and the character and the behavior is going to be a little different. It's but essentially, it's, it's going to go in the same place, the same way, the same directory. It's going to be a little different. But we've seen. Uh, on the other hand, um, most recent version of Ubuntu, uh, one sixteen right now, on, on some of my machines, it uses System D. Unexpected. And you know, System D works. And well, we'll argue about that later. So yeah. yeah. The latest Docker and system <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm ready to start. If I may ask, has everybody here gone through the first part here? Is there anybody new to part two? You're new to part two? Halfway through part one. Yeah. All right. So to recap, this is a two session talk. We went through session one. Session one was an overview on automation. And we talked about the big pieces. And the big pieces is sort of like a proof of concept talking about the principles involved. So we said automation, what is it, da 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 da. And we are going to in demonstrate automation in using Postgres, containers, Ansible, and ZFS. Now, I went through it. I went through a little bit of flame war talking about Docker versus Linux containers. I was very excited and motivated when I talked about that. Nobody dared to contradict me, which is really cool. <laughs> and we covered in detail Linux containers. And we talked about how to install it. And we're now going to go into the ZFS. Now, we talked a little bit about Postgres and install it in the context. Now, that's one of the ironies about this presentation. I am talking about, this is a Postgres track, this is a Postgres talk, but we're hardly talking about the configuration. We're hardly talking about turn on this, turn on that. It's about, oh, by the way, you said the configuration, then you turn it off, da. That kind of stuff. Give me shit. I'll accept it. I have a psychiatrist. 
<laughs> okay, this next part, open ZFS. ZFS on Linux. Once upon a time, there was a great evil monster called Lord Oracle. Lord Oracle <laughs> acquired things. It acquired a little place called Solaris. Solaris was made up of wonderful little people, but they got swallowed up by Lord Oracle. Some of the people left. They created their own problems. In the final days of Sun, they created the file system called the ZFS. They had various connotations, Zeta Bio file system, and then they had arguments as to what it really means. However, before the end of Sun, the BSD community, FreeBSD, started on a project undergoing, let's parallelize, let's create an equivalent. And they removed all the licensing restrictions. Now Sun, in, to their credit, they, they made it as easy as possible. And when they left, when it shut down, when it migrated over to Oracle, there were groups, team. One of them reproduced next generation of Solaris. Another was next generation CFS. The Oracle ins acquired both, per se. They acquired MySQL, per se. They acquired Java, again, Lord Oracle. So, so OpenZFS was a result of many events. It is a consortium, and it is based on the descendants of the Solaris Sun experience. They have a very viable uh, operating system. They have, uh, there's actually companies as part of the OpenZFS group based in San Francisco that are uh, service providers, data centers. And some of them have Postgres and they work on ZFS and those things are fast. They match anything out there in the industry. They tuned it really, really good. Now what they said was, all right, we want ZFS to continue, so they created the consortium. Consortium included representation from BSD and Linux, ZFS on Linux, which started a few years ago. It does not have the same capabilities as, uh, say, the ZFS in, that Oracle has, or the mature version, or the version that BSD has. But what it does have is good, is stable, it's not going to go anywhere. So let me get my password back in. Okay. So, again, reiterating the workstation. This is the workstation that I use to install ZFS. In this particular case, the Ubuntu page, the Ubuntu website says, okay, this is how you're going to install ZFS. My version was version 14. On version 16, the most recent version of Ubuntu, it's already part of the repository. However, ZFS on Linux has the links, has the capabilities for every major Linux distribution. What it does is it's going to go in and it needs the kernel source code and it's going to rip apart your OS and put it back together again so that it can operate with ZFS. Yes? I would add that um, it, although it is possible, I would suggest doing booting off of ZFS is probably not what you want to do um, for uh, setup reasons. There's been a lot of documentation online. I concur. If you want to use it for real, don't complicate your life. Just install the silly thing. Use it for your data. Okay. Again, as per beforehand, <laughs> When you install ZFS, I type out apropos ZFS, or the Canadian insist ZFS. Do you know how hard it is for me to switch between C and Z? I was taught Z by nuns. That's an experience you do not forget. Okay, so we have the various commands. Highlighted in red are really the essential commands. This is not a session about tearing apart and stuff, but there are going to be ZFS experts out there who really, really know much, much more than I do. ZFS is part of the, the file system. Zpool is what you're starting with. A pool is an aggregation collection of devices. Devices can be hard drives or they could be file systems that you create with DD. What it does is it sets the rule. Zpool is the first. It says, okay, 
These are the characteristics. I'm going to set up a raid. I'm going to set up multiple systems that are going to mirror. I'm going to set up multiple systems that are going to strike. I'm going to set up uh, uh, all sorts of essential characteristics on one level. ZFS does a whole bunch of stuff. Not only does it create the file system, it sets access control limits. It also says we can set change the properties. And those properties, like there's what, 40 different properties right now in the Linux implementation. Robert, yes. Sorry, were you, did the Voodoo using uh, Open ZFS or um, ZFS on Linux? Open ZFS is the parent hierarchical organization. Did it use on ZFS on Linux is the actual project that ZFS is installing on, on, on all Linux derivatives, no matter what distribution it is. Is it separate, is it always separate by uh, blobs? Is it never? It's, it, the separation is by organization. Open ZFS are doing the most advances in the changes in advancing the, the operating system and the file system. They have a policy. Anybody who comes up with a good idea, we will merge it and then everybody gets it. It doesn't matter what architecture it is. It, it can be on the uh, Solaris Descendants, it can be on the BSDs, it can be even Oracle, or it can be on the Linux. Everybody benefits. That's what the ZFS, Open ZFS does. ZFS on Linux is the project that just concerns with making ZFS fly on Linux. Yes? What do you think the path is to getting all this baked into the distros? So I don't have a compiler. Uh, there are, th that's, that's rather complicated. The only way to not get it uh, compiled in is to have a pre-made distribution. Here's the problem. The most important kernels in Linux, that's GPL version two. ZFS operates on a different license. They're not incorporated from the start because of licensing issues, not because of technological. It, it's the name of the game. Uh, typically, when you install ZFS, your kernel becomes tainted. That's, that's the official expression. It means it is now mixed with other uh, services. You have the complete right to do that, but you have these conflicts. If you have something like Red Hat mixing this up, they're going to have problems because the licenses are going to conflict, and it's going to take a lawyer to say which one dominates, and that's going to have ramifications on their whole business model. If I might expand on that, right now on Ubuntu 16.04, you're, you can do ZFS pretty transparently um, in ways that might be legally questionable out of the box on, say, Debian uh, Stretch. You can also do it transparently through DK, DKMS, which handles building those kernel modules for you. So you're not, it is something is being compiled, but you're not compiling it. The OS is doing that all for you. It is an automated process. You don't deal with it, but it is recompiling. It just means that your uh, kernel updates might take longer. Who actually sent out a like did a community letter saying that we're taking this as the our official stance yeah. uh, on sixteen oh four that you know I'm looking for Kumbaya. Well, if I'm gonna bet the farm on something like this, I don't want my you know com kernel wise on compatibilities or whatever on businesses and enterprises to support it so I know how to submit If you sell your operating system, if you create a distribution, you're gonna have problems. But if you're offering services, there's no problem. Technologically, it's good. Legally, as long as it's furnishing a service and not the technology, you're good. Yeah, February of last year, Ubuntu uh, announced the ZFS is baked in to the 16.04. Yeah, yeah, okay. And in terms of data loss, ZFS is readable by more operating systems than any other file system except for uh, FAT32. Yeah, well, thank you, cameras. <laughs> Yeah. Back in the night with Oracle, we used to uh, set up like raw, raw partitions and things, and, yeah. and sometimes we do different uh, different uh, settings in the kernel with uh, if you're primarily read write, read only. Right? Yep. So, are those sort of settings in ZFS? Because I've never used ZFS, but uh, yep. Those parameters you're talking about are there. If you were to Google ZFS, I think some of you may have already done it or will do. You're going to find that the dominant pages that come up is Oracle. That is the result of Lord Oracle's capabilities of contaminating the internet. 
It's not about the superiority of technology. They have put themselves in the position where you want to see something, you're going to get an answer as per them. Now, here's the good news. What they do provide actually is, is actionable information that you can use straight on Linux, straight on Postgres. Every piece of information they give in the context of Oracle, 100% transferable to Postgres. No problems whatsoever. Okay, so in this case, uh, the first step, install ZFS. Okay, now you're going to create a pool. Now, this was a little extra. Really, if the system is installed, it, the module's already been installed, and it, it, it's up in, in, in memory, and it's working on the OS. Um, here's the command, zpool create, and this, the F switch, is basically if there's any issues, like if I was overwriting an existing zpool, it would just rewrite it. Say mosh and just ignore it. Uh, it's a force. It's a force switch. So I've given the name opt underscore ZFS because opt is a nice traditional directory name. Opt is there. Opt is optional. So I said, okay, nice. And in this case, I actually had an extra spare drive. So uh, I put it in and I used it. And I just pointed to the device and it picked it up. Now, the pool took only a split second to be created. It was one device. Arguably, you could have multiple pools, and these pools, they're like raids. You can actually assign tasks to the different devices. There is logging, there is caching. This does everything on one device. Okay, that's cool. You can do the raid, you can do the mirroring. If you're up to speed on the concepts and the ideas behind raids, it's implicit, this does it. There are so much opportunity, we're starting to go into the black box of options. So again, I want to keep this as simple as possible. Now I'm going to create the ZFS. Now, this is a little different from the standard invocation. I am creating a mount point for the Linux containers. Here's a, a little tip. If you make your Linux containers first before you create your ZFS file system, the ZFS mount will fail. It'll just say, hey, there's something in the directory. Please deal with it. So I just are right. You know, take everything out. Uh, this is nice. The nice thing about CFS is once you create your pools, once you create your mount point, it's, got, it's going to stay there. You reboot the system, it's going to be there magically. It's going to act normal. So in this particular case, I'm creating a file system, off CFS slash LXC, that's all that's here. But here's where the Linux containers are there. I'm just using the default path that Linux containers store themselves by default. I'm, being, I'm just being easy. Okay, so, using the P switch, which is a bit like make directory switch P, this will implicitly create your subdirectories, nice and easy. And guess what? Another little bash loop. So I'm on the host machine, and I'm gonna create the file system. And I'm, crea I'm creating two things. One, I'm creating the backup. Now. This demonstration doesn't necessarily use everything, especially when I go into Ansible, but this is the expectation. In a mature environment, you've got backups, you've got write-ahead logs, you've got, the data, uh, you've got the data cluster. One other thing that we do or do not do is we don't take advantage of all the other switches and capabilities of Postgres. Postgres can split up things. We're not doing that. We're just doing the basics. This is the basic basis. Pardon? Are write-ahead logs not version dependent? Wouldn't you put them inside the nine point six folder? Write-ahead logs? Yeah. Oh, I, I could leave the, the, the data clusters there. But if I'm going to carry on see with the demonstration, say, okay, backup recovery, replication, yeah. that kind of stuff, uh, point in time recovery, I always use the wall. Um, I actually have these fights with people um, when they want to use stream replication. I don't trust the environment. I've seen the environment break, so I always have a backdoor. My backdoor is to have write-ahead logs generating simultaneously. The only reason it doesn't happen is if there's ordinary real scheduling reasons, I can't do it, there's no space, or there's political reasons. But, barring all that, I cover my ass. I have the write-ahead logs because things happen. I'll give you an advantage, uh, no, uh, uh, an example. You have a data center. 
you've got a company that comes in, they're going to set you up. They're going to set up a cloud presence, okay? Well, they're a DBA. He knows things, okay. He sets up stream replication. Well, here's the problem. What happens when the data center interrupts between the data center and the cloud? Maybe it's for a few minutes. Maybe it's going to be for a couple of days. Can it happen? Hell yes. Will it happen? Maybe not. But if he's confident with stream replication and he doesn't have wall archive, he's fine. I'm sorry, inefficient is the but um, he can't, he's going to have problems. Let's assume something else. Now, a reasonable data cluster size right now on commodity machines is between two and five terabytes. So that means if you have a data center, you're talking about a collection of machines. How many have you got? 5, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60? 60 times 5? You're going to reload that much up back to the cloud? Oh, Google would be so happy. Walls. That'll cover you. Yes? I think the question was more why is the wall path not involving the version, whereas the data path is? Oh. Postgres community implementations always includes the version number. When they create a directory, they say home directory slash the version of Postgres slash data. That's their decision. I'm following the convention. But you aren't following that for the wall because the wall doesn't include the version number. No, but I do say PG1, PG2, PG3. The reason is, is what if you have upgrades? What if you have failovers? So what do you want the version number, whereas you don't have it right now? It's, again, it's, 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 there's more than one way to skin a cat. I have thought about it when I was creating this, and I said, okay, let's keep it straightforward, let's keep it simple. The biggest advantage about this is that we know by association that it's related to the data cluster. In a mature environment, when you're mixing and you don't want to contaminate walls, sure. You might want to consider that. At this point, I follow the convention. The convention says when Postgres is installed, it creates a path with the version number. So I follow that convention, and I'm consistent when I use the file system. So when you go, when you sudo into a container, it's going to say home directory slash 9.6 slash data. That's the way it writes. If you put in another binary, if it goes to, if you install 9.5, it's going to say home directory slash 9.5. Just for this point of view, just for this, it's good. Also, in the real world, you're going to have mixed environments. It's very constructive if you have more than one way to figure out what version of Postgres you've got. And having it on the directory path is, is useful because you're going to be there for one reason or another, and you're going to see, oh, it's this. It just helps if you've got more than one way to answer a question. And having this written out follows the convention as the Postgres community creates and is self-documentation. Yeah, but, uh, for, for the data directory, yes, but why don't you have it for the wall? Because I didn't bother. Okay. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, okay. <Thanks>, anyway. <laughs> While we're looking at the screen, before the screen saver comes on, take a look at the numbers. Okay, on the left, file system name. On the right, mounted on. So obviously you can you can navigate it using command line or any utility that you want. You can SCP or SFTP, and depending on permissions, you'll get in. That's one thing. Next, look at the size. You notice how every file system is the same size. In this case, 217 gigabytes. That's because I didn't install access control limits. By default, every file system, which is distinct, has access to the same resources. On the file system, has the same permission on the file system. And by the way, in the context of containers, that's the same way too. Default installation of a container has access of all the RAM, all the CPU of the host environment until you decide otherwise, which is kind of nice, because that means if you have batch loads, 
well, all right, it gets to use it, and the other ones, will, they're okay, they don't mind. You don't have to figure out the logic. That's part of the reason why VMs are not as, as exciting now as containers are, because they locked in the environment. You made some assumptions. You had to calculate that. In the used, you will see that the numbers vary. That's the isolation. The file systems are isolated. Okay, here's another way of reinterpreting it. This is using the command ZFS list. In this case, it's just listing the file system itself. ZFS is capable of full manipulation. What we saw on the previous screen was list, just ls, and we see everything. Same information. Properties. Lots and lots and lots and lots of properties. I'll show you an example. This is only a partial snap, uh, snapshot. There's, I think, 60 or 80 properties here of, uh, of the operating system. Huge, huge amounts, huge opportunities. Uh, again, some of this is almost like black box. You don't know what's good until you change it, that kind of thing. Um, have you ever, anybody here ever been to a kernel meeting? I mean, that's weird. It's very black boxish, very wizard. You think Harry Potter was magic? Okay. The corollary to ZFS get, ZFS set. Set the environment, set the properties. Look at the bottom half of the screen. This, again, it's a little bash script looping through on our host environment. This is what it's doing. All data clusters are going to have a certain uh, compression ratio. LZ4. The wall locations are going to have GZIP9. And a low demand wall is going to be 16 megabytes, it's going to be 16 megabytes, it's going to be 16 megabytes until you compress. You can bring that compression down to 10%. GZIP assumes that you're only going to read it, you're not going to manipulate it because it's a CPU. So I said, okay, highest compression for the wall. You can change this. LZ4 is interesting. LZ4 is considered the most efficient algorithm for reading and writing. It's the most performant and for its ability, with its trade-off, the best compression. It's not as good a compression as GZIP, but it's really, really fast. So you have to take that into consideration. Nice thing about compressing a data, uh, a data cluster it actually reads faster. Yes? So your student is thinking about this amount, you didn't create a volume for doing this? Pardon? You're not, you didn't create a volume, right? Well, the file system, yes. You're just going to use file system. Yeah, I'm defining individual file systems. Like, uh, I, I, here's the names here. If you look at the end, yeah. off DFS, data, PG, the number, each individual file system. But you didn't specifically use Z ball to create the volume? No, no, I used Z pool. And then I did ZFS create, and then I'm changing the default. Now, I could have established the, 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 the properties ahead of time. And again, it's, you know, pick your flavor, pick your pick. So here's something else. Third line, record size equals 8K. That's a Postgres specific optimi optimization. Now, you will find references, but they're not common out there on, on the internet. 8 kilobytes is the size of a Postgres page. The file system on ZFS defaults at 128K. That means if you leave it at its default, there's going to be an inefficiency. It's not going to break. It's just going to make it a little inefficient. If you can fit the file system to 8K, that means a page, bang, goes in. There are no partial reads. The operating system doesn't have to take into account. It's a lot more efficient, a lot faster. The blocks of information, the pages are easier to push and pull. A time, oh, there's an old school thing. Postgres, turn off the A time on your directories. So because when you create a directory, you don't care when it was updated. You don't care when it was created. You just want to put the information in and pull it out. Housekeeping, you don't, you don't need it. Log bias, okay. Again, log bias. Oracle actually did a good job of explaining that part. ZFS has the ability to manage memory. It has the ability of deciding how fast information goes from whatever process is generating 
to the hard drive. The log bias, when you set it to throughput, means don't cache. Get it straight to the system ASAP. It's like in Postgres, F-Sync. There's a trick. Turn F-Sync off, and you can suck up data into the Postgres cluster really, really fast. Normally, you don't use it under operating procedures, but if you're rushed, you turn it off because then there's no reading. There's no double checking. It just sucks it up. It just assumes, of course, that nothing's going to break while you're loading the system. And most people, they trust their systems. It's not going to break. Afterwards, then you can restart and turn on, turn on their thing. OK, so log bias is the same thing. Now, to my knowledge, at this point, there may be other useful options in regards to Postgres. These may or may not be the best values, for example, the GZIP, if I should use 9 or not. This is all about judgment calls on your part. This is where science turns into art. Okay, next screen here. So, I'm using uh, an invocation ZFS get switch D2, and I'm asking for the properties for compression and record size for OpDFS data. And you notice that it's descending. It's descending to it's descending directories, which is nice. So these are all individual file systems, each one. They're not common. And you notice uh, the, the properties uh, set up on them for those two particular properties. Very nice, very neat. Very good information to get if you script it. Provisioning. Okay, put on your imagination hat. I didn't have enough time. I would have taken another week to draw in the nice pictures. Imagine this. We have a cluster. We are going to create a copy of the cluster. This cluster is on ZFS. Now, I've got here in this slide um, Ansible scripts. That's, again, Depending on how much time we got here, and I've got 15 minutes, so which means it's going to be for the Ansible tomorrow. Ansible scripts here is going to be about these are the steps needed to create a snapshot. A snapshot is instantaneous. It could be 100 megabytes, it could be 100 gigabytes. This is easy. No complications, no PG based backups. But this assumes in this example we can shut down the server. In real life, there's alternatives as well. So I shut off the server, I create a snapshot, take a set. Split second, turn it back on. I create a clone. The clone is read writes. It's not going to affect my original, but it makes another enhancement. I can now turn that thing on and do things with it. I update the configuration file. In this case, I update it because I wanted to run this on my host environment, and I actually source code compile my Postgres. So my configuration files are a little different. I had to tweak it and tune it because I'm going to turn on this clone from the host and not from the container or not from another container. Again, judgment call. This is where science goes to art. You get your choices. Permissions drives me nuts. All containers are going to have the same permissions. But ironically, the permissions, when I say Postgres, is Postgres on a container. That's not what it is on my host. So I have to conform it. In this case, see, because I created a source compile, I use it in my home account. It's not OS, it's local. And I do this because I experiment and I'm always trial testing various versions of Postgres and I just put it in the home account. I compile it, I put in the features so I can keep up. I start the machine again. This is user specific invocation. I turn on the cluster, poof. This is the clone. The snapshot itself is read only. You can read it, you could copy it, but you can't turn it on because it's read only. You need the clone. So this is what it looks like. You can see here, pg1 slash 96, there's the at symbol. That's how you know. That's how you know when you've got a version that is running as a snapshot. The at exists there. I created dev, the last line, op dfs pg1 underscore dev. That's my clone. Tip, when you start doing this stuff, Come up with a nice naming scheme. Otherwise, you're going to be really confused two months down the road. Destroying is very simple. 
Again, you can do it recursively. All I have to do is destroy the snapshot, and it'll automatically destroy the phone. It might be a good idea if you shut down the binary, you know, in case you have the delete. Promoting. OK. You have the original, you have the snapshot, you have the clone. There is a relationship. All changes on the master, on the original, is being kept in the file system. The snapshot freezes the definition, so it doesn't notice those changes. The clone only records those changes after it's been cloned. Promoting is a special process. You've created a clone. It's now going to be standalone. It really has its own relationship. You're going to take away the relationship between all this stuff, so you promote it. Snapshot and clones are almost instantaneous. Promotion, that's a copy. That's going to take a bit, so you'd be ready for that. Now, in terms of recovery, in terms of analysis, in terms of development, I think you, we can live with clones. But if you're trying to make something for real that's going to have its own existence long term, you should consider promote. Here's the algorithm for cloning a slave. Again, really, really simple. Shut down the server. Create the snapshot. Uh, I've added some extra uh, variables here on my, uh, my Ansible. And I'm saying, OK, this is the configuration. Imagine you've got a real machine, and you've got your Postgres there. You don't want to put ZFS there. Because frankly, one of the drawbacks of ZFS is it is less performant. The question that you should ask is, do I want it because it's less performant, or do I want it because it will do good enough? If you can answer yes to that second question, then you should use it on your master machine, on your primary machine. If the performance is not up to snuff, if it can't read write as fast, say EXT4 or Linux Volume Manager, or you haven't got the mastery of ZFS yet, or you're starting out, then the safe thing is you have your master and you have a slave on ZFS because that's read write, that's read only. That'll work no problem. You can clone that slave. That makes it really interesting because now you have the ability of doing instant backups. Barman is a system that copies walls and copies clusters. That can take days, depending on the size of the system. But you use ZFS, you do a snapshot off a slave, it could be multi terabyte. You have the ability to rebuild that, to have a, a, a point in time of that server in, in seconds. Very, very useful. There are San Francisco companies, they don't do backups. They use snapshots. And then they restore the file system. And they don't do point in time recovery, they snapshot every five minutes. And then they have a, a, a process that will purge the older snapshots. So efficient or inefficient? Again, this is going to be a judgment call. The nice thing about walls is that if you do do wall archiving, and if it is a slave, if you promote it, you can read from the walls. You can rebuild, just like uh, the original machine. Lots of opportunities here, lots and lots. So this is just a simple definition, a simple demonstration. You turn on the slave, everything goes on, it will manipulate. You'll be able to use it normally. You'll be able to interact with it normally. It makes it really, really good. Certainly, I would recommend it for development environment. I would, uh, I'm not talking about QA because QA, you might want to emulate performance capabilities on your main machine, but it will also save your key certain backups. Base backups. Okay. A base backup of a filing system is a command line invocation. You can save the instructions, the definition describing that file system as a text file. ZFS has the ability. You would say, say start a, ba a base backup. You create a snapshot. Again, a fraction of a second. You name it. Then you do an initial backup. Initial backup is you're going to use two commands. ZFS send, ZFS receive. Receive can be on another machine. Or it could be another location on your machine, on your main machine. When you're done, the send receive, you could say stop backup. 
that's, this is the base backup technique for creating a, a, a backup on a machine remotely. That, that's the traditional way. Um, with something like uh, PG Restore, PG Backup is automatic. This is manual. You have to, using this technique, it's out of norm. It's not a normal Postgres process. So you have to use the old school method of PG Start Backup, PG Stop Backup. That's still available in Postgres to explicitly say, you're going to record the walls and, and identify those walls that are going to be ingested in what you're copying. Yeah? Couldn't you do the move the stop backup to right after the, the taking the snapshot? Could I? Move the PG stop, stop backup um, up a command to right after the snapshot? No, because what we want to do, um, because the yes, actually, yes, that is correct. You could do it that way. Um, because um, there's a lot of options. If you did want to do point in time recovery and you wanted to decide to keep on doing a recovery a little bit after, like for me, I would have a bit of a time delay. I wouldn't do it right away. Maybe it would be something between what I've said here on the slide and what you're describing. Yeah, again, you've got choices. Um, the bottom is an alternate method. The ZFS send, you could actually, it's a file. You could save it as a file. You could send it to a normal file system, an EXT4, and hold it there. And you've got a collection. That means you could gzip it as well. There's a utility called file on the command lines. If you use file and then you name that, uh, that collection, that, that, uh, that backup, it will actually identify it as a ZF file, uh, ZFS file system. Very useful and certainly uh, if you're going to script any of this stuff. Now, incrementals. An incremental is you have a base backup and, oh, now I'm going to take a snapshot next day, next day, next day, or next hour, next hour. You don't want to do an entire base backup. What you do is you take a snapshot and you do the diff. What you're going to do is send the diff between the last backup and now. So essentially here, all you're doing is you're naming your backup. See, in this case, I did a dot one. So you write it out, you send receive. There's a little couple of switches inside the ZF, uh, CLS send. And this is actually instructions, the R and the I, that, OK, I'm doing incremental. Please send the appropriate instructions to its target. Arguably, meaning what would happen is if this is a cluster that's been reconstituted in the DFS file system, it's actually going to take up the changes and put it there it's going to update that. So you would never do a complete backup again afterwards. And that is it. It is now 11.30. The one module that I've got left is Ansible, which will be tomorrow. And I'll go into detail tearing it apart and going into it. Questions on this wonderful marathon? Yes, the one from the person who likes drinking. Like what? Uh, you wouldn't put DevBoss inside your container. It seems a little old, didn't it? Uh, no, I didn't put it inside the container. The default permission in a Linux container actually discourages you. You'd have to tweak the configuration to, to do it. Um, so rather than take the time of tweaking it, I said, all right, let's just keep things simple. Go to the host. You can emulate. If you were emulating an environment, that might be a good way of doing it, but you have to use the configuration file. There's something that, uh, a container in a container, there's actually a configuration on the containers that allow you to create subcontainers, which means you could emulate CFS on the file system <coughs> or subnetworks and emulate you know, two key points on your system. So yeah, you, you get really monstrous complicated. Yes? I have a tech question. The uh, uh, orchestrating um, containers, would you recommend using containers or, or installing Postgres directly on bare metal in a production environment? In production environment, I would say you would, right now, let's be conservative, start with a solid machine, but use the, um, or say that again, use containers in, in the real environment? Orchestrate the container rather than. Oh yeah, yeah, no, you, yeah, you could do that. I, 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 have, be really fast. I have no problems about putting a container, Linux container, in a production environment. The only caveat is the industry caveat about security. You need to go through that exercise.
But in terms of performance and stability, no problem. Okay. Other questions? All right. Uh, thanks for being patient. And uh, come on back tomorrow and see the Ansible, and I'll, I'll tell you about that stuff. Okay. Go on, Village.